Thank you, Brian, for leading us in worship. Thank you, praise team, as always. Um, very encouraging time to sing together. I love uh, the lyrics to that song, All of Life Comes Down to Just One Thing, that's to know Jesus and to make Him known. So we're here this morning um, to know Jesus so that we can go out there and make Him known. So where do we go to know Jesus? We go to the Word, right? We go to the Word, and so uh, this is our time to go to the Word so that we can know Jesus more, so again, we can go out and make Him known. So hopefully you have your Bible. Um, You can get it out and turn it to Mark uh, chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. The passage this morning is Mark 3, um, 13 through 19. And uh, this passage marks a transition in this gospel. Up to this point, Jesus has really been focused on the crowds, the multitudes. Uh, Going forward, Jesus is going to focus on just a handful of men. Uh, Twelve men who were initially part of a uh, much larger group of, of, of students of Christ. You know, there were many people, we looked at this last week, there were many people who came to Jesus to sit under his teaching. Right? These people were called disciples. The Greek word is methetes, which means students or learners. And there were a large number of people in that group. Well, Jesus is going to choose 12 men out of the bunch to be his apostles. Okay, disciple, the word disciple uh, means student. Apostle means messenger. Disciple was a passive role. There's a lot of listening and learning. Uh, Apostle is a much more active role, a lot of going and doing. Apostles were Jesus' special messengers sent out to preach the gospel. Who would Jesus choose? Well, certainly nobody from the Jewish religious establishment. You know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they hated Jesus. They had rejected Jesus. Who were the Sadducees and the Pharisees? Well, the Sadducees were wealthy elitists who were put in charge of the Jews' precious temple. Uh, The Pharisees were the pious legalists who put themselves in charge of enforcing rules and rituals on their own people. Uh, The Sadducees hated Jesus and wanted him dead because Jesus had gone into the temple and flipped over their tables and chased out all their money changers. Jesus, in fact, Jesus condemned the Sadducees for turning God's house into a den of thieves. And the Pharisees hated Jesus and wanted him dead because Jesus called himself God and he openly defied all their unnecessary, unbiblical rules. Uh, The Sadducees and Pharisees thought they were leaders enlightened by God. And Jesus exposed them for who they really were, blind guides. Uh, Jesus said they were were the blind leading the blind, Matthew 15, 14. Uh, The Sadducees and Pharisees thought they were the protectors of God's truth. But in Mark chapter 7, verse 9, Jesus condemned uh, the Sadducees and Pharisees for replacing God's truth with their own petty traditions. The Sadducees and Pharisees thought they were children of God, but Jesus told them who their real father was. He said to them, you belong to your father, the devil, and your will is to carry out his desires, John 8, 44. It, guys, it's crazy. The, the Pharisees and Sadducees thought that Jesus was empowered by Satan, but in reality, it was the Pharisees and Sadducees who belonged to Satan, not Jesus. And so Jesus had the religious leaders pegged And the religious leaders wanted Jesus dead. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus. And so Jesus honored their their wish by choosing certain men to be his followers who were so far removed from the religious establishment. And the number of men Jesus chose was was 12. That, That is not by accident. That is not by accident. There were 12 tribes of Israel... Remember the tribes? Twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes were God's people. And Jesus chose twelve men, none of which were religious leaders. And the message Jesus sent to the religious leaders was this. You guys are not part of my family. You're not one of my people. You're disqualified. And so you you would think that that would wake the Pharisees and Sadducees up. They would snap out of it, repent, and turn to Christ. But, But their hearts grew harder and their hatred grew hotter to the point of making plans to kill Christ. Jesus knew what they were up to because he could see into their heart. Jesus knew the hatred that was lurking deep inside them. Jesus knew murder was on their mind and 
Jesus knew that it would all eventually lead to the cross. Now, his time had not yet come. We talked about that last week. Jesus' time had not yet come, but it was inching closer and closer. And knowing that, Jesus decided it was time to choose a handful of men who would carry on the gospel mission after he was crucified. In our passage this morning, we're going to see who Jesus chose. Okay, so let's get into it. Look at verse 13. This is where we left off from last week. Verse 13, Mark chapter 3. It says, and Jesus went up on the mountain. So remember last week we saw how people came from every direction. People came from the north, south, east, and west to see Jesus. Verse 7 says that a great crowd followed him. So we're talking thousands of people, if not tens of thousands. And remember, Jesus healed their diseases and he cast out demons. And so who knows how many hours Jesus spent with that crowd. Or, or, you know, maybe it was more like days. The text doesn't tell us, but to minister to a great crowd, that's going to take some time. And so when Jesus had, had spent time serving the crowd, he went to an isolated place away from the crowds. Verse 13 says that he went up on the mountain. Mountains were very important in Jesus' ministry. You may remember it was on a mountain where Jesus preached the Beatitudes in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. It was on a mountain where Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John in Mark chapter 9. It was on a mountain where Jesus gave the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. And it was on a mountain where Jesus gave uh, his disciples the Great Commission on, in, in Matthew chapter 28. Here in Mark chapter 3, Jesus is on a mountain. And on this mountain, he is going to call 12 men to be his apostles. This is a big deal. When you think about it, these uh, would be the guys Jesus would pass the torch to. These would be the guys who would would carry on Jesus' gospel mission of seeking and saving the lost. These would be the guys who would lay the foundation of the church. This is a big time decision. And in Luke's gospel, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 12, we're told there that Jesus went up on the mountain and he spent the whole night in prayer. In Bible times, the night started at 6 p.m. and it lasted until 6 a.m. So for 12 straight hours, Jesus prayed to his Father. Which gets me thinking, how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? During Jesus' public ministry, he was always withdrawing to isolated places to pray. Um, When's the last time you've done that? How many important decisions in your life have you bathed in prayer? I don't know about you, but so many times I've gone to God in prayer after everything I've tried crashed and burned. Prayer is a last resort for many of us. It's the final straw. It's what we do at the end, not at the beginning. And here we see Jesus laying out the correct pattern for us. Before you do anything, go to God in prayer. You know, sometimes uh, we'll say, well, you know, I guess all that's left, all that's, uh, left to do now is pray. Right? Have you ever said that? All that's left for me to do now is, is pray. That's the only thing left to do. Let me get this straight. The, all that's left to do is go to the all-knowing, all-powerful, sovereign creator and sustainer of the universe. I guess that's all there is to do. Guys, it's what we must do first before anything else. Uh, James chapter 1, you know, I think it's verse 5. It says, when we lack wisdom, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. Prayer must be our first stop, not our last resort. Now, here's the question. Was Jesus lacking wisdom here in Mark chapter 3? Was Jesus at a loss for who he was going to choose to be his apostles? No. If you think that, you're confused as to who Jesus is. Mark has presented strong evidence proving Jesus is God. And here's the thing about God. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. That's what omniscient means, to be all-knowing. Psalm 147.5 says that God's understanding is infinite. Uh, 1 John 3.20 says that God is greater than our heart and He knows all things. Psalm 139.3 says that God is intimately acquainted with all my ways. Psalm 139.4, this is kind of a scary verse. It says, before a word is even on my tongue, you, O Lord, know it. 
Job 12, 13, wisdom belongs to God. Counsel and understanding are His. Hold up the universal symbol for what God doesn't know. Zero. Right? This is how much God doesn't know. He knows everything. God is all-knowing. And so, if Jesus is God, and He is, everybody say He is. He is. is, Okay? In the Gospels, Jesus calls Himself, I am, which is God's original name, Yahweh. So, if Jesus is God, then Jesus is all-knowing. Wisdom belongs to Him. So, Jesus did not spend 12 hours on the mountain praying and asking God for wisdom and understanding to help Him make the best decision. Put up your hand if you agree that Jesus already knew who he was going to choose. Now guys, I would like to suggest to you this morning that Jesus spent all night praying for his 12 apostles by name. He prayed for their faith. He prayed for their perseverance. He prayed that they would be strong and courageous. He prayed that they would be bold. He prayed for their ministry opportunities. And Jesus hasn't changed. Just as he prayed for his followers then, Jesus prays for you today. Let that sink in. I don't want to just rush past that. Let this sink in. Jesus is praying for you. The one who sits at the right hand of God the Father within whispering distance is praying for you. The Bible says that Jesus lives to intercede for you. It's great to be prayed for, isn't it? It's great to have people praying for you. It's even better to feel prayed for. But to know that the Lord of Lords is praying for you Well, that should fire us up this morning. That should fire us up every morning. Jesus wasn't praying for discernment. What am I going to do? No, Jesus was praying for his disciples, and he hasn't stopped. You are who Jesus prays for. And we know Jesus wasn't asking God for wisdom for who to choose, because as soon as prayer time was over, he immediately calls the twelve. Jesus didn't need time to think about it or mull it over. He already knew. Again, verse 13 And Jesus went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. Jesus already had his list. He had already finalized the roster. This was the team he put together. These were the guys he wanted. In fact, notice, uh, none of the twelve volunteered. They didn't sign up. No one submitted a resume. Nobody filled out an application. Jesus chose these men. Verse 13 says that he called them. In verse 14 it says, And Jesus appointed the twelve. If you skip down to verse 16, again you'll see it says that Jesus appointed the twelve. Jesus chose them and called them. He pursued them and appointed them. Jesus would remind the twelve of this later on. In in John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go out and bear fruit. Again, who chose who? Jesus did the choosing and the calling. Jesus did the pursuing and the appointing. But notice in verse 13, this is important. Look at verse 13. It says, And Jesus went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Jesus called, and they came. See, guys, that's a, that's a picture of how salvation works. In salvation, we definitely see God's sovereignty. Jesus called, that's God's sovereignty, but you also see man's responsibility. They came. In salvation, there is divine election. God chooses us and calls us to himself, but in salvation, you also see human volition. We have to come to Jesus by faith. There's both. There's both, and a lot of churches, a lot of denominations will teach one over the other. Some people believe salvation is, is all free will. Other people believe that there's no free will at all. It's, it's only God's sovereignty, and, and, and those who only hold the one exclusively, I believe, I believe they go to extremes and they fall into error. I believe the Bible teaches both divine election and human volition, both human responsibility and God's sovereignty. Jesus said... No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's God's sovereignty. We cannot come to Jesus unless God calls us or draws us. But then Jesus also said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's human responsibility. We still have to come to Jesus by faith. All that to say this, I would have never come to Jesus by faith if God didn't first choose me and call me. 
I would have never come to Jesus by faith if God didn't first choose me and call me. People debate this all the time. People say, I won't believe in election because that means that God chooses some and not others, and and my God would never do that. Guys, those people are living in a fairy tale world where they believe that everybody deserves to be chosen by God. Tell me, what does everyone deserve from God? Death, punishment, wrath, hell, all of the above, and yet God in His grace has chosen to save some. You know, the incredible thing isn't how come God doesn't save everybody. No, the incredible thing is how can God save anybody at all? God choosing us, calling us, drawing us. This should never be debated, only celebrated. Yes, I came to Jesus in faith, but that is only the result of God calling me to Jesus. I would have never come if God hadn't called In Mark chapter 3, verse 13, we see Jesus first calling the twelve to himself, and then we see the twelve coming to Jesus. First the call, then they came. And I get it, none of us can really reconcile God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. I mean, why would a person be held responsible for not coming to Jesus by faith if God didn't choose him to begin with? That doesn't seem fair. Do you understand that there are some things the Bible calls mysteries, and this is one of them? Divine election and human volition are two parallel lines that only intersect in God's mind. God's got it figured out. I don't, and so that provokes me to worship God, not war with God. He's God. I'm not. Wisdom and understanding belong to Him. He knows more than I do, and that's the way it should be. Okay, I'm not going to settle this debate this morning or any morning for that matter, and uh, I'm okay with that. You should be too. It's big God, small me. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his thoughts above mine. Everybody say, same with me. You good with that? I don't know what else to tell you. There's only one God, you're not him. The Bible says that God does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth, and no one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Whether you like it or not, God does the choosing. We didn't pursue God or choose God first. God did the pursuing and the choosing and the calling. And and guys, here's the thing that's so awesome. Since God chose me for himself, he's responsible for me. See, God saved me. God began that good work in me, and, and he's going to bring it to completion, Philippians 1, 6. God's, see, God's going to see this thing through. God's going to stick with me. He's responsible for me. And if God has chosen you and called you, you can say the same thing. I mean, how awesome is that? Is God irresponsible? Is God going to call you and then forget about you? Is God going to choose you and then discard you? Yes or no? If he did, that would be very irresponsible of God. God keeps his own. Now, up to this point, the twelve were part of that larger group of disciples or or students who learned from Jesus, and so the time had come for the twelve to be set apart from the group of learners and and to be pulled into a closer, more committed relationship with Jesus Christ. And and again, initially, Jesus had focused on the crowds, so now he's going to invest himself in the twelve. He's going to be about training this, this small group of men. Look at verse 14. And Jesus appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, apostoloi, meaning messenger or sent out ones. For what reason did Jesus choose these men? Well, there's two, and they both show up in our text. Number one, Jesus chose the twelve so that they could be with him. Now, do you see it there in verse 14? Guys, you should always be making sure what I'm saying comes from God's word. It is right in the text, verse 14. And Jesus appointed the twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him. Jesus made it official. You're with me. I want you to be with me. What an awesome privilege to be mentored by the second person of the Godhead. Do you think you'd learn a lot? Yes or no? Like how awesome would it be to have Jesus as your teacher? You know, my my favorite teacher ever was my fourth grade teacher, Miss Phillips. How many of you would agree Jesus is better than Miss Phillips? 
Okay. You don't even know Miss Phillips. She was a saint, but Jesus is Lord. So he's better. He's the best there is. And the 12 got to spend time exclusively, intimately with Jesus. What an amazing privilege they had to be chosen by Jesus so that they could be with him. You know, it's amazing that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords would want to be with any of us. But then again, Jesus loves us and he wants you to know him and to be with him. And listen, if you sense, I don't know where everybody is this morning spiritually, but if you sense Jesus is calling you to himself today, run to him in faith today. Again, Jesus calls and you come. The heart of Jesus is amazing. He chose these 12 men because he wanted them to be with him. That's what it says in verse 14. He appointed, he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him. And here comes the second thing. And he might send them out to preach. Again, apostle, apostoloi in the Greek. It means sent out ones. Jesus wanted to send out the 12 to do what? To preach. Jesus wanted to take them from students to teachers. These 12 men would be the first generation of gospel preachers. Jesus did it before them. Mark 1.14, we looked at this several weeks ago. It says that Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Jesus preached. Jesus preached that the only way a sinner could be forgiven by God and given eternal life, it's through repentance and faith. The only way to heaven is by turning away from your sin and believing in Jesus as the only basis for your forgiveness. That's the gospel. Jesus preached it. And when he was gone, these 12 men would preach it. Guys, Jesus was a preacher. I mean, he was a lot of things, but... He was a preacher, more than he was a healer, more than he was a provider, more than he was a miracle worker. Jesus was a preacher. Before Jesus, there was John the Baptist. He was a preacher. Before John the Baptist were all the Old Testament prophets. They were preachers. The apostles would carry on that legacy. They would preach the gospel. The apostle Peter he would preach his first solo message in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus resurrected, 10 days after Jesus ascended. On that day of Pentecost, Peter stood up in Jerusalem and preached, and 3,000 people repented of their sins and believed in Jesus for their salvation. 3,000 people. The people didn't respond to a program or a policy. It was preaching that led to their salvation. You know, churches can have 101 programs. Churches could have a policy manual 10 inches thick. They could be strong in programs, strong in policies, but if they're weak in preaching, that's a fail. What did Peter do on the day of Pentecost? Did he put together a program? Did he write out a policy manual? No, he preached the Word. And how many people got saved? 3,000. It's the faithful preaching of God's Word that changes lives. And you got to know, I am so confident in that, so that's why every single week I stand up here and I just preach the Word. Because personally, I'm not the best at programming. And I'm okay with that. I have been called to preach the Word. Now understand, I'm no apostle. Okay, apostles uh, had to be witnesses to Jesus' earthly ministry. I wasn't there. And nobody else today has been an eyewitness of that. There are no apostles today. Okay, no matter what somebody posts on their church sign or church website, there are no apostles today. Furthermore, I haven't laid the foundation of the church. That's what the apostles did. And today, you have pastors, not apostles, you have pastors who are building off the foundation the apostles already laid. But pastors are to be using the same tool the apostles used, which is the truth of God's Word. Preaching God's Word. Again, Peter stood up and preached and 3,000 people were saved and the first church was formed. Tens of thousands more were saved and added to the church in the months that followed Peter's first sermon. Again, the apostles were standing up and preaching the gospel and people were responding. People were repenting of their sins and believing in Jesus. Jesus chose 12 men and he appointed them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. Jesus chose 12 men and commissioned them to go into all the world and make disciples, Matthew 28, 19. Jesus chose 12 men and informed them that the church would be built upon their foundation, Ephesians 2, 20. 
Through the apostles, God's truth would be communicated, articulated, and recorded in the New Testament for our eyes to see. It's a big job. It's a difficult job. Jesus warned the twelve ahead of time just how hard it would be. I want you to just listen to these verses from Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to start reading in verse 16. Jesus says to the twelve, imagine how hard this would be to hear. Jesus said to them, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. So if they have called the master of the house of Satan, how much more will they malign those of his own household? See, guys, that's what Jesus says to the apostles right before he sends them out. Like, not a great pregame speech. You would never hear those words at a pep rally before the big game, but Jesus was telling it like it really is. I remember in, in college... We played this uh, university in Philadelphia. It was, it, was our, uh, it was our district championship game. It, w- it was soccer season. So we had, this, we had this big pep rally the day before, and, and everybody was fired up about how we were going to just destroy this team. They ended up beating us 5-0. to zero. I mean, this is soccer. Losing 5-0 to zero is really embarrassing. It would be like losing a basketball game by 100 points. And, you know, I really wish somebody at the pep rally would have been like, you guys are going to get beat down. But nobody knew. Nobody knew. Listen, Jesus knows what's going to happen before it happens. Remember Psalm 139.4? Before a word is even on my tongue, you, Lord, know it. And so Jesus tells the twelve like it really is. Here's, here's what's going to happen to you guys. Here's how hard it's going to get for all of you. And, you know, these men still went out. At times, they lacked faith, but they still went out. And they turned the world upside down with the gospel. How? How? Listen, the twelve did what they did only because they had been with Jesus. Jesus appointed the twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with Jesus. Him, Mark 3, 14. I want to make sure you're all with me. So everybody, everybody, raise their Bible like this. All right, grab it from the spine. From the spine, like this. We're going to do an old-fashioned uh, sword drill. Remember sword drills? Okay, and I got a prize this morning. The prize is this Milky Way bar, okay? It's been in my pocket, so it's a little soft, but you hungry? You got to win the sword drill, all right? Got to win the sword drill. So swords up by the spine, no cheaters. Okay, here's the verse. Everybody repeat after me. Acts 4.13. Nope, nope, nope. Keep it up. Repeat it. Acts 4.13. Charge. I got it. I got it. I win. Acts 4.13. Listen to this. Listen to this. Now... When they saw, you guys are so mad at me, right? This is going to taste amazing, all right? When they saw, okay, I can't do this here. We got a young girl up front turning their Bible. You deserve that. You deserve something. All right, Acts 4.13. Put it in the fridge. It'll harden up, I promise. Now, when they saw, when they, so that would be the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, who were apostles, and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and recognized, here it is, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. That is the only explanation for why these guys had such an impact. They were uneducated common men. I mean, for sure, four of them, possibly seven, were fishermen. Doesn't take a lot of brains to cast and reel. One was a despised tax collector, another was a political zealot, but then Jesus chose them and called them. He spent time with them and discipled them. He changed them. He equipped them for ministry. Jesus empowered them through the Holy Spirit. And guys, as God, not only is Jesus all-knowing, but Jesus is also all-powerful. 
He's omnipotent. 1 Peter 5.11 says all power belongs to the Lord both now and forever. So how much power belongs to the Lord? All of it. How long does he have it? Forever. And Jesus is all powerful for all time. Power in its entirety belongs to Jesus. And so when he called the twelve, he freely gave them power. It's his to give. And Jesus gives it to the twelve. We see this in verse 15, Mark 3.15. It says that the twelve had the authority to cast out demons. Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 it says that they were also given the power to heal every kind of disease and sickness. They, listen, they got that from Jesus. They had been with Jesus. So real quick, I just, I, I want to point something out. I want to make sure you're seeing this. In Mark chapter 3, the passage we're looking at right now, what was mentioned first? Jesus appointing the twelve to preach the gospel or Jesus empowering the twelve to perform miracles? What came first? Preaching. Preaching was primary, healing was secondary. Dealing with the spiritual need through preaching the gospel, listen, that is more important than dealing with the physical need through some miracle or wonder. One of my commentaries says, the healing of bodies must take second place to the saving of souls. Keeping people out of hospitals is not nearly as important as keeping people out of hell. The vertical is more important than the horizontal. The spiritual is more important than the physical. The message is more important than the miracle. Preaching comes first. We need to be about that. And Jesus was. He appointed the twelve to preach the gospel first. And then he gave them power to cast out demons and heal diseases. And guys, the reason Jesus gave the apostles power to perform miracles, the reason was just to authenticate and validate that the gospel message they preached was true. Hebrews chapter 2 says the gospel was first declared by the Lord. It was attested to by the prophets, by the apostles who heard it, in which God bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts. Again, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus chose the twelve so that they might be with him. Jesus appointed the twelve to preach the gospel. Jesus empowered the twelve to perform miracles to validate their preaching. Who gets the credit? Who deserves the glory here? Jesus, again, none of the twelve even volunteered for this. Jesus did the work, and when Jesus was done with these guys, they were a force to be reckoned with. So who were these guys? Who were the twelve? Well, Mark gives us the list. And so what I'd like to do is just take our time and go through it so we can see just how unqualified these guys were when Jesus called them. All right, look at verse 16. I think that's where we're at, verse 16. Let me just double check here. All right, verse 16, it says, Jesus appointed the twelve. So here it comes, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. Now, in the Bible, this is all fresh because we've just, we did a whole summer study on the twelve, so this is all really fresh to me. There are four lists of the twelve in the Bible. There's a list in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. Four lists, and the orders, uh, the order of the names will vary from list to list, but in all four lists, the first name, the name at the top is Simon. This guy was the leader of the group, the spokesman. He, uh, he usually piped in first. Uh, John MacArthur uh, calls him the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. And so when Simon, listen, when Simon was first called to follow Jesus, the guy loved to argue. Ever met anybody like that who likes to argue? Maybe you're that person. Have you ever said of somebody, you know, if Jesus were to show up, he'd argue with him? That was Peter. Or Simon, I should say. Um, Simon, it's the one he usually argued with was Jesus. So how is that going to go? Any ideas on who's going to win? Yeah, my, money, my money's on Jesus. For example, Jesus in the upper room. Last Supper with the Twelve. Jesus, that very night, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be handed over to the Romans. And Jesus, before all of that, in the upper room, he's washing the disciples' feet. And Simon gets into an argument with Jesus. No, Lord. Simon says, no, Lord. So Simon's argument flies off the rails in his first two words. No, Lord. No and Lord do not belong in the same sentence. If Jesus is your Lord, do you tell him no? We do it all the time, though, don't we? Jesus says, love your enemies, and yet by our actions and attitudes, we say, no, Lord. 
Uh, Jesus says, forgive 70 times 7, and yet, and yet with our resentment and bitterness. We say, no, Lord. And Jesus has told us a lot of stuff, and, and we claim he's our Lord, but then we tell him no. Like, how, how, how does that work? Simon tried it. No, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said to Simon, unless I wash your feet, you'll have no share with me. Simon was like, well, then give me a bath. There's another instance where Jesus is informing the 12 apostles about his rapidly approaching death. Jesus is preparing them for his crucifixion. And Simon again, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. See, Simon was going against God's predetermined plan, and that's when Jesus told Simon, get behind me, Satan. A third argument occurred as Jesus left the upper room, and he was headed to Gethsemane to pray, and he told his disciples that they would all fall away on account of him. They would all run away, and Simon says, no, Lord, they may fall away on account of you, but I never will. And Jesus says, Simon, this very night, you will deny me not once, not twice, but three times. Who was right? Jesus. So you know the game Simon says? Don't do what Simon says. Simon says, no, Lord, don't do that with Jesus. Three times Simon said that, and if it was baseball, it would be three strikes and you're, and you're out, but not with Jesus. Amen? Not with Jesus. Jesus is all-knowing. He knew what Simon would do before he called him, and yet Jesus called him anyway. Jesus even gave him a nickname. We see the nickname right in our text, verse 16. What's Simon's nickname? Peter, which means the rock. So long before Dwayne Johnson, there was Peter. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus says to Simon, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. See, Peter would be a pillar of the church. Jesus would use him to, to lay the foundation. Back to the list, look at verse 17. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. So James and John. James is the older brother. John's the younger brother. Both had issues. James had a short fuse. If he didn't get his way, he would snap. So on one of their ministry trips with Jesus, the twelve were headed from Galilee to Jerusalem. And the most direct route was to travel straight through Samaria. The only problem was the Jews hated the Samaritans and the Samaritans hated the Jews. Of course, Jesus tried to tear that nonsense down. In fact, you may recall Jesus reached out to the Samaritan woman at the well and he saved her. He then went back to her village and gave the gospel to all of her neighbors. Jesus healed the Samaritan from leprosy. Jesus even made a Samaritan the hero of one of his parables. Right? You may know it as the Good Samaritan. Jesus loved the Samaritans. He loves the world, right? He desires that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so Jesus isn't afraid to go to Samaria. In fact, on this trip from Galilee to Jerusalem, Jesus wants to stay overnight in Samaria. He wants room and board there, so he sends a few of his disciples ahead to make the arrangements, and the Samaritans reject their request. And James finds out about it. He flies off the handle. He says, Jesus, do you want me to call fire down from heaven and burn them all? I mean, let's watch them burn. Let's have a big bonfire tonight. Settle down, James. Settle down. You're completely missing the point for why Jesus came. Jesus came to save people from fire, not usher them into it. And then there's James' brother John. John was so judgmental. John wrote about love more than any New Testament author, and he was the least likely candidate to write on that subject. Because starting out, John was brutal. There was an occasion where the disciples saw a man casting out demons in the name of Jesus. I mean, this guy, we don't know his name, but this guy was helping people and healing people, and John confronts him. And John tells him to knock it off because these are John's words. You're not one of us. You're not one of us. We're apostles. You're not. We're better than you. James and John, loud, reckless, oppressive. That's why Jesus gives them their own nickname. We can see it in verse 17. Look at that again. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom Jesus gave the nickname Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Sons of thunder, not a compliment. When, when Jesus gave Simon the nickname Peter, Jesus was saying, this is what I want you to become. 
And when Jesus gave James and John the nickname Sons of Thunder, Jesus was saying, this is what I want you to change. They were loud, abrasive, they scared people. In fact, there was an ongoing argument among the twelve about which one of them was the greatest. And this was a point of contention in the group for a long, long time. Guess who started the argument? James and John. They got their mommy to ask Jesus to give them the best seats in the kingdom. Not a great list so far. You got Simon, who loved to argue. James, who was angry and violent. John, who was proud and judgmental. So let's see who next. who's next. Look at verse 18. Andrew. Andrew, the older, lesser-known brother of Peter. Before following Jesus, Andrew was a follower of John the Baptist, and Andrew was not a standout disciple. He was quiet, shy, not one of his sermons is, is recorded in the Bible. Did he even preach a sermon? You would often find uh, Peter out in front, leading the way. Meanwhile, his brother Andrew would be in the back, bringing up the rear. Andrew did not like preaching in front of crowds. Andrew was more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of guy. Every time you see Andrew in the Gospels, he's bringing individuals, not crowds, to Jesus Christ. In fact, Andrew was the one who introduced Peter to Christ. Andrew was the one who brought the boy with the five loaves and two fish to Christ. Andrew, timid, afraid. Don't, don't put me out in front. I'm, I'm fine back here. Again, verse 18. Philip, or Andrew, and Philip. So Philip... What is he? Number, number five on the list. Philip was your quintessential pessimist. If things didn't add up in his mind, he was like, it'll never happen. It can't be done. An obvious example of this is the feeding of the 5,000. Okay? There were 5,000 men plus their family, so this was probably more like 15 to 20,000. And all these people have been listening to Jesus preach all day long. It's dinner time, and Jesus says to Philip, I love that he singles Philip out. Jesus says, where are we to buy bread so that all these people may eat? Think Jesus knew? Yeah, the text goes on that he, was, he said this to test Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. But Philip, you know, he's already doing the math. He's crunching the numbers, and his negativity came out. He was like, 200 denarii. Wouldn't it be enough for each person to even get a bite? Like, I've been running the numbers, Jesus, and it's impossible. Philip's talking to Jesus, the one who can turn stones into bread and water into wine, and Philip's like, Jesus, it's impossible. It'll never happen. Where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? We're not. We're just going to have to send them home hungry, and that's when, you know, Andrew, he comes running up after that. He comes running up to Jesus with the boy with the bag lunch. He's so excited. Right? I find this boy, five loaves, two fish, and then he hears Philip spill out all his negativity, and Andrew's like, but what are they among so many? And Philip just sucked the excitement out of Andrew. Right? We've all heard of those, uh, are they dirt devils, dirt devil vacuums, they just, they suck up dirt. Philip starting out, he was a joy de devil. Philip would flip the switch, out came his pessimist, and he just sucked the joy and hope out of people. Have you, ever, have you ever been around those people where, where you literally have to pump yourself up to have a conversation with them because they're just so negative all the time? Joy devils. That was Philip. So we have Simon, James and John, Andrew and Philip. And do you see the next name in verse 18? Bartholomew. That's his generic name, Bartholomew. It just means son of Ptolemy or son of Thomas. His first name is Nathaniel. First time we meet Nathaniel Bartholomew, he's so critical. He's so full of prejudice. Nathaniel's introduced to Jesus. Nathaniel was told the Messiah, whom Moses wrote about in the law and all the prophets spoke about, the Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. And Nazareth was a, was a one camel town in the middle of nowhere. And Nathaniel says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? I hate that place. Anybody who comes from Nazareth is a nobody. At first, Nathaniel refused to believe who Jesus was because of where he came from. That's prejudice. Prejudice has no place in the life of a, of a Christ follower. After Bartholomew or Nathaniel or whatever, Mark mentions Matthew, also known as Levi. We, remember, we were introduced to uh, Matthew in Mark chapter 2. So let's see if we remember, before he was called to be an apostle, what was he? 
He was a tax collector. He was a Jew hired by Rome to steal money from his fellow Jews. Matthew was a traitor and a thief. He was an extortionist. The Jews hated Matthew. Jesus chose him. After Matthew, we see Thomas. He's the next on the list in verse 18. Matthew and Thomas. So, like Philip, Thomas was a pessimist, always negative. Always negative. There was an instance when, when Jesus wanted to go to Jerusalem. The last time Jesus was there, the Jews tried to kill him. And so the twelve are like, uh, how about no? Let's, let's not go to Jerusalem. And Thomas was like, well, let's go, that we may die with him. Like, how dark is that? And, and then, of course, when Jesus did die and the disciples went back to the upper room and, and, and they were hiding out of fear, Jesus shows up, right? This is his first resurrection appearance to the apostles. Guess who's not with the group? Thomas, he's off pouting somewhere. So the apostles, you know, they're good friends. They go to Thomas. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And Thomas is like, impossible. Impossible. I won't believe it until I see it. And so that's, of course, where he gets his nickname, Doubting Thomas. Are you getting the point? That the men Jesus chose to be his apostles, they're all screw-ups. They're all screw-ups. I, I know we put them all up on a pedestal and we like to, to enshrine them in stained glass windows, but they all had issues and hang-ups and shortcomings. They're just regular people. They're like you and me. Negative, angry, judgmental, critical, proud, cranky, full of doubt. That's all of us. We're not even done with the list yet. It keeps going. After Thomas, Mark mentions James, the son of Alphaeus. In Mark chapter 15, verse 40, he is called James the Younger or James the Less. So think about it. You already had one James in the group, right? James, the brother of John, the son of thunder. Well, this other James, James number two, they called him Little James. So you had a big Jim and a little Jim. In fact, I did some study this week. This, this is fascinating to me. Do you know that, um, that this is where, you probably didn't know this, this is where that beef jerky company got its name. I'm not sure if you knew this, but Slim Jim originates with James the Less. Isn't that fascinating? I totally made that up. But, <laughs> like, that was a lie. But this disciple, James the Less, just a kid, he was young, short, immature, he makes the list. After Slim Jim comes Thaddeus, also known as Labaius, also known as Judas, not Iscariot. Some of you are like, Thaddeus, Labaius, Judas? Who is that guy exactly? I don't know. Out of all the twelve, we know the least about this guy. The meaning of his names gives us some idea of who he was. Thaddeus literally means mother's baby. We would say mama's boy. Labaius means heart child. We would say drama queen. This guy was emotional, spoiled. I would imagine he whined a lot. Right? You got one of those in every group. I'm hungry. I'm hot. I'm tired. How much longer? I want mommy. Everybody say wuss. Right? Judas, I kind of think he was a wuss a little bit. And yet Jesus wanted him. Next on, on the list, the, this guy's the opposite of a mama's boy. His name was Simon the Zealot. The zealots were a, a group of uh, assassins who targeted Roman politicians, Roman soldiers, Roman officials. Zealots hated all things Rome, and they were determined to overthrow Rome at all costs. Zealots were also called sacari, which means dagger men. Dagger men, they would hide these long curved daggers in their robes, and they would go into the public square and sneak up behind Romans and put a knife in their back. They were murderers, hateful, violent, rebellious. Simon was very much a part of that group. Last on the list, the most notorious of them all, we can see his name in verse 19. Look at that. In Judas Iscariot. Um, Judas Iscariot is mentioned last in every list. He's last on every list, and in every list his crime is mentioned. Do you see it there in verse 19? In Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. Now can I just say, Judas, he started out well. He really did. He served the Lord for a little while. He showed signs of loyalty. I mean, he, too, had to leave everything behind to follow Jesus. I mean, Judas was elected to be the treasure of the whole group, and yet he betrayed the one who chose him and loved him. 
You got to understand, Jesus knew Judas Iscariot would betray him. It was all part of the plan. It was prophesied hundreds of years earlier in the book of Psalms and Zechariah. Jesus knew. But what's awesome is Jesus treated Judas so well that none of the other disciples ever suspected that it was Judas who would betray him. Now that's loving your enemy. Which can I just, can I just say, I'm going to step away a little bit from the message, just step aside here. Jesus understands betrayal. Isn't that good to know? Because, you know, you live long enough, you're going to be hurt by the people you spent time with. You're going to be disappointed by the people you shared your life with. You're going to be betrayed by the people you gave your heart to. Judas Iscariot still live on today, and you're going to encounter at least one in your life. And these are the people you thought had your back, but instead they stick a knife in it. Listen, Jesus understands. Jesus understands he's a savior who sympathizes. He gets it. I love that. We serve a God who's felt what we feel. We serve a God who's faced what we face. Judas Iscariot, the one who wanted to be first, is mentioned last. Judas followed Jesus because he thought Jesus would set up his kingdom on earth and give him the best seat in the kingdom. Judas thought following Jesus was the fast track to fame and fortune, to power and wealth and honor. Judas Iscariot was from the tribe of Judah. He thought by, that by going with Jesus, he would one day sit on a throne and rule over the whole tribe. That's what Judas thought. And when the crowds wanted to make Jesus their king, it must have shocked Judas when Jesus refused Instead, Jesus was always talking about going to the cross and dying for sin. Judas Iscariot was appalled by that. He was even more appalled when Jesus told them that they would be sent out as sheep among wolves and they would be persecuted and flogged. I mean, where's the honor in that? Judas wanted the crown. Jesus spoke of the cross. And Judas could not make sense of it. Judas had all these expectations that Jesus did not meet. And so Jesus was a disappointment to Judas. So Judas sold Jesus out. I mean, Judas wasn't about to walk away empty-handed, right? He was going to get something for his trouble. So he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And in the process, Judas forfeited his soul. Judas Iscariot's story is tragic. I mean, he crashed and burned into literal flames. He's in hell today. That's where Judas Iscariot is. But the other 11, their story ends much different. You know, starting out, none of them would have made our list, not with what we know now. Let's recap. Peter was argumentative. James was angry. John was judgmental. Andrew was timid. Philip was negative. Nathaniel was prejudiced. Matthew was a thief. Thomas was a doubter. James the Less was a shrimp. Simon the Zealot was an assassin. Thaddeus, Labaius, Judas was spoiled. They were all uneducated, unqualified. This was true of them all when Jesus called them. But much later, they're completely different. Completely different. I mean, Peter, the one who denied even knowing Jesus, was willing to be crucified upside down for Jesus. James, the one who wanted to be the first and the best in the whole group, he was willing to be the first in the group to be martyred for Jesus. He was beheaded by King Herod in Acts chapter 12. John, the one who was full of pride and thought he was better than everybody because he got to be an apostle, he, he, was, he was later exiled to the island of Patmos where he lived out his days in humility, alone, and forgotten. But that's also where he wrote the book of Revelation. Andrew, the one who, who didn't want to stand out or speak up, the one who preferred to stay back and blend in, he was later uh, tied up to an X-shaped cross and beaten to a pulp. And for the two days he hung there, he boldly witnessed to everybody who passed by before succumbing to his injuries. Thomas, the one who was like, I, 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 I won't believe Jesus rose again until I put my hand in the spear mark in his side. Uh, Thomas ended up being run through with a spear because of his bold preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Philip, the one who was so negative and, and, and refused to believe in Jesus' power to do the impossible. It'll never happen. It can't be done. Philip ended up being stoned to death for preaching about Jesus' incredible power over sin and death. 
Nathaniel, the one who refused to believe Jesus was the Son of God and the Savior of the world, all because Jesus was from Nazareth. Nathaniel ended up being tied up in a weighted sack and dropped in the sea for preaching Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. You know, Matthew, the guy who took from people, stole from people, he ended up having his life taken from him as he was burned at the stake for his faith in Jesus. James the Less, the puny, wimpy, immature little boy who wouldn't come out of the shadows, he later went out on his own and brought the gospel into Persia where he was either stoned to death, beaten to death, or crucified. We're not sure how he died, but he did die for the cause of Christ. Judas Labaius Thaddeus, the spoiled, rotten, overly emotional mama's boy, he ended up taking the gospel to Mesopotamia, which is where he was clubbed to death for his bold, courageous preaching. Simon the Zealot, the one who was more than willing to take a life for the sake of liberty, he ended up giving up his life for the sake of the gospel. See, guys, at first the apostles were one way. Later on, the apostles were another way. And the thing that happened in between was Jesus. The only explanation is that these guys had been with Jesus. That is the testimony of every Christian. That's my testimony. I was once this way, now I'm another way, and the thing that happened in between was Jesus. Is that your story? Is that your story? Is there any evidence you've been with Jesus? Have you been transformed? Are you different from the way you used to be? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about some of our people. I'm almost done, I promise. I ended short last week, so I have, I have some time saved up. Um, I'm going to talk about some people. I don't, some of them aren't even here, so I'll just, behind their back, it's okay. All right, it's all good. But we got Norm Wood. Guys like Norm Wood. You know, he's retired. He could be out playing golf, which I would like to see that. Um, he could build the clubhouse. I mean, he could literally build that. I'd just like to see him swing the golf club. But he could be doing that. He's retired. He and Sandy could be down south enjoying life on the beach. But, but you know, Norm and Sandy, both of them spend so much of their week here serving, giving, working. Like, how is that possible? Because most people who retire, would you agree, most people who retire, they don't retire to volunteer at church. How come Norm and Sandy do? Because they had been with Jesus. Um, I'm looking for them. Jim and Marcy Decker. There's Jim in the back. Right? I cannot even begin to tell you how generous those two are. Earlier in the summer, after they put their whole family put in a full day volunteering for an outreach event at church, they came over to my house. After all that work, all day long, they came over to my house. Jim put in another six to eight hours working on my garage. It needed a new door, needed some trim. I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. Jim did it all. I just kind of handed him the tools and even messed that up. And instead of me buying dinner for them, Marcy goes out and buys dinner for me and my whole family. You know, most people, after doing a project for somebody for like, you know, six to eight hours, they expect to get paid or at least a gift card to a nice restaurant. But Jim fixes my garage, and then Marcy buys me dinner for it. What in the world? They have been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. Jerry Foster. Lead pastor of this church for a long time long time he saw this church through some of the hardest times God used him incredibly here still using him so he hires me four or five years he mentors me and grooms me to take his job he steps down I step in Jerry stays on as an associate and he's done nothing but encourage me and help me and support me do you understand most people would not be that way with their replacement which there's no replacing Jerry by the way 
The only explanation is Jerry has been with Jesus. And there is story after story about person after person in this church where I think to myself, you people are amazing. Like, how are you so wonderful? How are you so generous and gracious and loving and caring and forgiving? It's because you have been with Jesus. And then there are some of you, there are some of you, you've been coming to this church for a long time now, and you don't know Jesus. You don't know Jesus, but you keep coming, and one of the reasons is because you are drawn in by this loving congregation. You're like, I don't know Jesus, but I I like the people in this church. Listen, the people in this church know Jesus. They've been with Jesus. That's why they're able to love you like they do. So here's what I'm getting at. Like, what makes a Norm and Sandy Wood such faithful servants? What makes a Jim and Marcy Decker such generous givers? What makes a Jerry Foster such a humble encourager? What is the reason for any good thing in any of us? Jesus. Jesus is the reason. Jesus gets the glory. Jesus makes us what we are. He's chosen us in His sovereignty. He's called us by His grace. He's empowered us with His Spirit. He's discipled us through His Word. He's changed us through His discipline. It's because of Jesus. We have been with Jesus. I was once once one way, now I'm another way, and the thing that happened in between was Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29. I'm going to read this and then I'll be done. The Lord chose what is foolish in the world. The Lord chose what is foolish in the world, like fishermen, Peter, James, and John. The Lord chose what is weak in the world, like like shy Andrew and little James and mama's boy Thaddeus. The Lord chose what is low and despised in the world, like Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. That's who Jesus chose. Why? 1 Corinthians 1.29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of the Lord. That's why. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the faithfulness that you show us every Sunday through your word. God, it's through your word where we see you and we know you. It's through your word where we see your heart, your love, your sovereignty. God, we thank you for calling us out of our sin, dead in sin. Ephesians 2, 1, we were dead in our transgressions. Nothing we could do to change that or fix that. Nothing we could offer you at all. And yet through your mercy and your grace, you chose to set your love upon us. You called us to Jesus Christ. You drew us in. Yes, we respond by faith, but we have to admit this morning that the only reason we had the sense to respond is because, God, you called us, you chose us, you opened our heart to believe. You gave us eyes to see your truth. You gave us ears to hear your truth. You gave us a mind to understand it. You gave us a heart to receive it. Salvation is a work that you do. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift so that no one can boast. And God, you choose nobodies. You choose nobodies. That's all you have to choose from. We're not any better than anybody else. What sets us apart from anybody is we've been forgiven. And that forgiveness is made available to all. God, if there's somebody here this morning who is sensing God's call, They can feel, they can sense the Holy Spirit is doing a work in their life and they're being drawn in. God, I pray that 
that they would do what the twelve did. They would come to Jesus. They would respond in repentance and faith. God, we pray for this every morning, every Sunday morning as a church. We pray that somebody would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We ask that now. This is a work that you do. We ask that you would do it for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.